So turn to uh, Exodus 21. We're looking at the incredible journey of the Jewish people as God has led them out of bondage in Egypt. After 400 years, God gave the, the Egyptians 10 plagues. And because of the 10 plagues, Pharaoh finally said, get out of here. And so they leave. And then the, the Pharaoh finally says, I'm going to kill them all. So they're pinned in at the Red Sea. God opens the Red Sea for the Israelites to go through on dry land. And then he brings the walls of water down upon the Egyptian army. They all drowned. And so we celebrate, as we saw back in chapter 15, um, then they start complaining, you know, we don't have any food. So God says, okay, I'm going to give you manna from heaven. So they were fed every day as the Lord provided manna from heaven. And then he's given them water from the rock. And then we saw in chapter you know, 19 and 20, God descends down upon Mount Sinai in power and with thunder and lightning and the whole mountain shakes. And he gives them the Ten Commandments. And as we've seen in chapters 21, 22, and 23, these are known as, it's been called the Book of the Covenant. This is where God expounds on the Ten Commandments. And as we saw last time, the Lord had a lot to say about bond servants, bond slaves, how the Jewish people were to help each other get out of debt. And that was their way of getting out of debt. You would become someone's servant for six years if you were in debt. On the seventh year, you were let free. And then last time we, we wrapped it up by looking at uh, basically the sixth commandment about thou shalt not murder. And so God laid down the law as far as accidental death, you know, manslaughter, uh, violence, first degree murder. And so as we'll see in God's justice system, it was all about restitution. Um, God did not say anything about incarceration back then because it always involved restitution. It meant that the whole family would be responsible for helping make things right with the victim's family. And the reason was God wanted all the Jewish people to see themselves as one big family. And they really were. I mean, the 12 tribes of Israel, Jacob. And so that's one of the, the family dynamics that makes the Jews so distinct from so many people in the world. Even today, you know, when you look at October 7th, before October 7th of this year, Israel was divided. There was a lot of bickering going on, a lot of protesting going on. But since that horrible day when 1,400 Jews were slaughtered and uh, horrible things done to them and taken into captivity, some, you know, 200 plus abducted. You, you haven't seen Israel united like this in many, many years because they look at each other as brothers and sisters. Unfortunately, anti-Semitism is still on the rise and it's still very much alive. And so keep that in mind as we go through these chapters because God is dealing with the Israelites as with his own children. And his goal is that his people would live with each other in harmony and in truth with care and respect and so when we go through these some of these things might not you know relate to us um, a lot of people skip over these chapters and they think well God is either too harsh or I don't really relate to these things that he's talking about all these different laws and you know for us some of these laws don't apply they might seem outdated but you know we have a lot of laws in our land that don't apply even today and you can do a quick Google search, that's what I did, and you can find some really, really stupid laws that we have in our book still. For example, did you know that it is, that, that whaling, whaling, killing whales, is illegal in Oklahoma? <laughs> I don't remember Oklahoma ever having a seaport or anything. In San Diego, this one makes a little bit of sense, from San Diego, that's where I grew up, uh, it's illegal to have Christmas lights up after February 2nd, or it's a $250 fine. If we live in cold places or a lot of snow, that wouldn't apply, but San Diego makes sense. In Alabama, wearing a fake mustache to church that causes people to laugh is illegal. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Uh, I like this one. In Georgia... It is illegal to tie up a giraffe to a light pole. I mean, when was the last time you saw something like that? In Arizona, it is illegal to have a donkey sleeping in your bathtub. These are real. In Utah, 
in Utah, it's illegal to not drink milk. To not drink milk. It's illegal in Utah to not. So if you're lactose intolerant, you're going to be put away. <laughs> so in Denver, it's illegal. And this makes sense. 150 years ago, uh, to not ride a horse in Denver while intoxicated. But this one is weird because it's also illegal in Denver to lend your vacuum cleaner to a neighbor. I, I don't know why, but that's on the books. So even though some of these laws in Exodus may not apply to us today, the principles still apply. These things, you know, these laws that we're looking at, our founding fathers studied these chapters, and much of our Constitution is based on the book of Exodus. And so they went through these chapters very carefully. And so we see a lot of principles that help set up our legal system, such as having a trial by jury, having judges, evidence, you know, through eyewitnesses. Um, punishment must fit the crime. We'll see that one this morning. Property rights and, and the biggie. A person is innocent until proven guilty. That all comes out of these chapters. Now, again, America is not Israel, and a lot of these laws were for the Jewish people when they came into the promised land of Israel, but the principles still apply. As I mentioned last time, God's laws were a huge contrast to all the other nations around them. Most of the pagan nations, they had no laws. I mean, they did what they wanted. It was utter chaos. They were very wicked. They would sacrifice their children to their pagan gods. They would kill anybody that came against them for no reason. And so it was a real mess. And as the old saying goes, with freedom comes responsibility. And God is giving them ultimate freedom. He wants them to experience true freedom rather than living like these pagan nations. But God's laws preserved life. God's laws gave people dignity. God's laws gave people respect for others. And wherever God's law went forth, wherever God's word has been heeded, wherever the gospel has gone forth, the people in that society are elevated. It happens every time. Morality and safety and freedom begin to flourish. But wherever God's word is rejected, Wherever the gospel is rejected, man's laws will be harsh and cruel and really unfair. And you can go to pretty much any country, uh, well, I'd say in the Middle East, outside of Israel, and you're going to find some very harsh laws. Like if you're a woman in Iran and you show your face in public, you could be killed. Literally, they could stone you right there. They could put you in prison. Protest the government in China and you might disappear forever. But again, God is all about life and liberty and knowing him and growing closer to him. So again, keep that in mind as we go through these verses. So we'll pick up in chapter 21, verse 18. Some interesting things to look at here. If men contend with each other and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, and he does not die but is confined to his bed... If he rises again and walks about outside with his staff, then he who struck him shall be acquitted. He shall only pay for the loss of his time and shall provide for him to be thoroughly healed. So again, you have two guys fighting. Nothing new. It's happened since the beginning of time. But here we see that one of the guys gets injured but is recovering. So God makes it clear that the guy who won the fight is responsible to take care of the person he hurt, who he had victory over. That would do a couple of things. First of all, you might be careful that you don't pick on little guys. You whoop them up, and now you're held responsible for paying their expenses, their medical bills, their lost wages, and so forth. Again, this is a nation of brothers, and God tells them that you are required to take care of your family, and that's how God saw the children of Israel. You had to compensate the family of the person you injured. Now, we have similar laws in America, but unfortunately, most of our laws have been abused, misused. I mean, so many people are so happy over everything, and they'll take people to court over everything, but God wanted his people to care for one another. And this whole idea, Jesus says, I give you two commandments, love God, love your neighbor. And this is all part of loving your neighbor. Now, look at verse 20. And if a man beats his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely 
be punished. Notwithstanding, if he remains alive a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his property. That literally means he's his money. He's his debt. The, the bond servants that are mentioned here, they were in debt. They would sell themselves to their master for six years maximum. And then after six years, they were let loose. So if one of them was killed, then that master could be severely punished. Oftentimes, they could be put to death for killing a male or female servant. But you got to put yourself in the historical context here. In the ancient world, this was shocking because they would look at servants and slaves as nothing. Those people were garbage. It would be like you and I. We'd break a toaster you throw it out. You break a waffle iron, you toss it out. That's what they did with people. They just tossed them out. They tossed them aside. Why would you spend money on an individual that's serving you who is now hurt, who's wounded? You would just put them out of their misery, get rid of them. But God says, no, I want my people to understand I am all about life. I place a high value on life. For example, on the bad side of things, Cleopatra. Remember Cleopatra? One time, well, she was really into poison. I guess you got to have a hobby. So she was into poisons. At one time, she poisoned, literally poisoned, 275 of her servants. They all died. 275. To them, it was no big deal. She just was doing what she wanted to do. They didn't care about people. You realize when... The Soviet Union came into power back in the early 1900s over the next, I think it was 60 years, maybe 70 years before they broke up. They slaughtered 40 to 80 million of their own civilians because they did not agree with communism. In China, it's 60 to 80 million that they slaughtered that didn't get along with Mao and others. I mean, our nation, we can't say, oh, we take the high road. We've slaughtered 70 million babies in the womb. I mean, we are a very guilty nation. So we cannot claim moral high ground on these issues. But these are important. Now look at verse 22. If men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished according to accordingly as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judge, judges determine. But if any harm follows, then you shall give, this is where it comes from, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Very interesting section of scripture. So you have two men fighting. Let's say one of the guys picks up a rock and throws it at the guy, and he ducks, but it hits his wife who's pregnant behind him, and she gives birth prematurely. Now, if she and the baby both lived, then the husband could impose a fine against the guy that threw the rock. But if either the wife or the child in the womb died, that guy would be put to death, life for life. Now, this is one of many verses that considers an unborn child as a person, not a fetus, not a mass of tissue. Both that child in the womb is a person. That child in the womb is a human being. God's very clear about this. And I don't care what our government says. I don't care what our president says. I don't care what our governor says. That baby in the womb is a human being that must be protected. Even though Roe v. Wade was overturned June of 2022, each state now has the option to do what they want to do. And unfortunately, there's a lot of states that are pushing this, like California to the nth degree, where you can literally kill a baby when it's born. And that's still under the protection of their uh, horrible abortion laws. So we need to pray, we need to do what we can to stand up against the murder of babies. Now, verses 23 to 25 has become known as the lex talionis, the lex talionis, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and so forth. The Latin means the punishment shall fit the crime. In civil matters, this was an act of mercy. In other words, the guilty person could not receive more punishment than what that person did. Critics say that God is mean, that God is sadistic, 
But the truth of the matter is this. God is just the opposite. This law was to be a guideline to the judges in Israel that they were not to go beyond what happened. You know, if somebody slapped you upside the face, you could not cut off their hand. I mean, that's human nature, isn't it? God knows our sinful hearts. He knows that humans will often punish people unfairly. We will often punish people too much, or even in our society today, not enough. And justice was never to be determined by how much money you had or how little money you had. You know, we're, we're told justice is blind. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. Unfortunately, we see wealthy people in our country getting away with crimes that most of us would get jail time for if we did the same thing. But God says, no, the punishment must fit the crime. You know, I'm sure, I don't know, I know when I was a kid, if somebody punched me, I'd like, hey, why did you hit my arm like that? Well, I barely touched you. No, you hit me like this. And then you hit them harder. I didn't hit you like that. I hit you like this. And they hit you harder. And then pretty soon it escalates and you're in a fight. I mean, that's just human nature. I didn't hit you that hard. Yes, you did. And it just builds and builds. But that's, again, our human sinful nature. So this law says punishment must be equal to the crime, not more, not less. Again, this was a radical concept back in those days. People could kill you for just looking at them funny. Again, we see this all over the world. People will do something minor and they'll lose their hand or they'll be thrown in prison. Now, Bible critics will try to say Jesus contradicted God's word here um, because in the Sermon on the Mount, he will talk about this issue, but it's not a contradiction. Remember, Jesus is clarifying, he's expounding on God's law with the Sermon on the Mount. So this is what he says in Matthew 5, starting in verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the, your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you take away your and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. So the bottom line is Jesus is not overturning the civil laws that God is giving the Jewish people. He's talking about personal revenge. Personal revenge. At this time in Israel's history, the Pharisees taught that you were obligated to get revenge for somebody that hurt you. If they took out a tooth, then you would bash them in the mouth and get, take their tooth. I mean, they were very clear about it. Hey, brother, it's an eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Get even with that other person. Jesus is saying, for love's sake, sometimes it's better to forget about it and forgive people. The Apostle Paul understood this dis distinction between the civil authorities, our government, and personal matters. So when it comes to the civil authorities telling us what to do, this is what Paul says in Romans 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So he's speaking about the civil laws. Then you come into 1 Corinthians 6, and this is where Paul gets on the case of the Corinthians because they were suing everybody in their church. They were taking brother to court over petty matters. And Paul says, I say this to your shame. The things you're doing is wrong. You're going before unrighteous judges. So in 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 6, uh, verse six Paul says, But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? This is what Jesus is talking about. Turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. People want to know, well, can Christians ever sue other Christians? I would say after you take it to the church. The church should be able to figure it out. Paul says, we're going to be judging angels. 
And you guys can't even judge these simple matters between brothers and sisters in the Lord? I mean, shame on you, he tells us. And so we should be able to deal with some of these smaller issues. But big things, sometimes it comes down to, yes, we do need to call the cops. Yes, we do need to take this to court. You know, there are times when it is appropriate. We don't want to blow our testimony for Jesus over petty issues, though. As Paul says, if there's an issue between believing Christians, you should be able to settle it among the church leaders. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4, 8, And above all these things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. And so if we would all focus on being filled with the Holy Spirit, walking according to the truth of God's word, then there should be no reason for Christians to be dragging other Christians to court. Sometimes it's inevitable, but for the most part, we should be able to work things out. Now look at verse 26. Having fun yet? <laughs> this is an interesting section. Verse 26. If a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant, and destroys it, he shall let him go free for the sake of his eye. Again, you're six years into your paying your debt off, and in the first year you lose an eye because he hit you or something, then you're free. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, he shall let him go free for the sake of his tooth. Again, this shows the mercy of God. If a servant was struck by their master, they were you know, lose an eye or two, they were automatically set free. The debt was canceled. And so instead of being set free after six years, again, that's the maximum time of service, you would instantly be set free. So that means if the servant owed his master a million dollars and the master knocked out his tooth, the debt's paid. If I was in that predicament and I became a servant to somebody, Man, I'd be provoking the guy. I'd be like, come on, take a shot, you big oaf. You know, knock out a tooth, and then you're set free. But this is really an amazing law when you think about it. I mean, here's God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who has come down on Mount Sinai, thunder and lightning, fire and smoke, earthquake, the whole mountain's trembling, and he's concerned about your tooth, about a servant's tooth. God cares about the smallest details of our lives. Jesus will say that God has all the hairs on our heads numbered. And I know some of us are making it easy to count. But don't ever think that God doesn't care about you. I mean, He loves you more than you can comprehend. He loves you more than you can even imagine. So He cares even about this servant's tooth. Verse 28 I'm sure this all applies to everybody in here. If an ox gores a man or a woman, keep your ox tied up, folks. Maybe you have an ox, I don't know. Then the ox shall surely be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. But if the ox intended to thrust with its horn in times past, and it has been made known to its owner, and he has not kept it confined so that it has killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner also shall be put to death. If there is imposed on him a sum of money, then he shall pay to redeem his life whatever is imposed on him, whether it has gored a son or gored a daughter, according to this judgment it shall be done to him." So this law of God makes it clear the owner was held responsible for his ox. Now, again, the ox was a very important animal for the Israelites when they come into the promised land. That was their tractor. I mean, that plowed their fields. That ox was very, very valuable, very important. So a first-time offense required the owner to pay a price to the injured family, and that ox would have to be killed. But it ha if it's an ox with an attitude and it's done this before, it's hurt people or it's killed somebody else, the owner of that ox would be put to death as well. Man, talk about personal responsibility for your belongings. You're going to be very careful with that ox. If it was an unusual situation, the injured family could receive compensation from the owner rather than death to the owner. Well, look at verse 32. If the ox 
gores a male or female servant, he shall give to their master thirty shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. Interesting. The price that you paid if your ox gored a male or female servant was thirty pieces of silver. Does that ring a bell? This is uh, will be a prophecy that will be in uh, Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. This prophecy concerns Judas Iscariot. Interesting. It says, Then I said to them, If it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Again, this is a prophecy that was fulfilled by Judas Iscariot. He betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a gourd servant. That's exactly how much the chief priest gave Judas to turn on Jesus. And after Judas realized what he had done was wrong, he tried to give the money back to the priests. And they said, ah, no, we agreed on this. We're not taking it back. This is blood money. And so he throws the 30 pieces of silver in the temple, just as it says there in Zechariah. And then they would take the money and they bought the potter's field, just as it says in Zechariah. It was for the potter. And that's where Judas would end up hanging himself. So that tells you how much value Judas placed on the Messiah Jesus, the price of a slave who is gored by an ox. Interesting. Well, look at verse 33. And if a man opens a pit, or if a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls in it, so you're like he's digging a well or something but doesn't have it covered up, the owner of the pit shall make it good. He shall give money to their owner, but the dead animal shall be his. So he can have a barbecue with it. If one man's ox hurts another's so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money from it. And the dead ox they shall also divide. Or if it was known that the ox tended to thrust in time past and its owner has not kept it confined, he shall surely pay ox for ox and the dead animal shall be his own. Once again, we see that God was all about equity and fairness, making things right with your brethren. And we also see within these laws, God wants each one of us to take personal responsibility for our property and personal responsibility for our actions. In other words, we all need to be careful with our little beagles. I, I always say, all oh, my beagles friendly, and he is. Lando's the friendliest dog. He loves everybody. He loves every dog. Some dogs are like, Arr! so it's like, no, he backs away. But he wants to say hi to everybody. He's just super friendly. So I'm not too worried about him. But if you got a pit bull or pit bull mix, you better be careful. This would also apply to your firearms. You better be careful with your firearms. And with everything that the Lord has entrusted to us, we need to be careful, good stewards, over whatever he has entrusted to us. Above all, he has entrusted to us as Christians the gospel. We're to be good stewards with the gospel. We're also to be good stewards as men, as the head of your household, the way you raise your children, the way you treat your wife. God holds us accountable for these things. So God is all about accountability. When the children of Israel came into the promised land of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel were held responsible to hold each other accountable. God did not want them living in chaos, in wickedness, like the pagan nations around them. And so his standards were much higher and infinitely better than the standards of the unsaved. And in reality, nothing has really changed. God wants all of us who call upon the name of Jesus to live our lives in such a way that people see a difference between us and the unsaved. It's common sense. We're to be light. We're to be salt. We're to love our enemies. We're to pray for those who persecute us. He doesn't want us living in chaos, but to stand on the truth, to live righteously, to be all about life and justice. And again, the standards are found in the Word of God, 
not in the vain philosophies of men. I mean, that's why I take issue so often with some of our decisions in our courts and, and with our government, our legislators. So often they'll put together these laws and it's like, are you kidding me? That's the opposite of what God's word says. How can you go along with this? I mean, how stupid is it in California to say, oh, criminals can go into a store as long as they take less than, what is it, $980? Then they're free to go. Come and go. That should be the name of every shopping center out there. Come and go. <laughs> you can come in, take what you want. We're not going to stop you. I mean, are you kidding? This is just allowing people to live in rebellion. And so it's hardening people's hearts to the things of God. These are the vain philosophies of men. God's word is very clear. We'll go through some verses here in chapter 22 quickly. This will expound on the eighth commandment, which is very clear. You shall not steal. Again, this ties in with private property, restitution. And once again, our founding fathers studied these chapters very thoroughly as they're putting together the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. God's word is valid for every person at all times. Look at verse 1, chapter 22. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. Again, we see that God was more concerned about restitution than incarceration. You lock the guy up, he's never going to repay. That's part of the problem in our you know, judicial system today. People in jail can't really do anything. And the people that get victimized, they don't get, you know, any restitution. So notice the penalty for stealing one ox was to repay with five oxen. The penalty for one sheep was to repay with four sheep. Now we'll also see that the family of the thief could repay the victim with five oxen or four sheep. Now obviously this did a couple of things. It would hold the whole family responsible for what their little thieving son did. <laughs> and they're going to watch over him. They're going to make sure that you're going to bring in the whole family, grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins, to make sure their relatives were living godly lives. Now, obviously, you know, and not only discourage someone from stealing, but it also put pressure on the family to keep each other accountable. If a thief stole an ox, again, that's a very valuable animal. It was like the family tractor. Well, the guy doesn't have five ox, otherwise he wouldn't have stolen one. But now you get all these family members together, and they have to give up an ox. Five ox for that one that was stolen. You think that's going to change their outlook? They're going to be like, okay, we're going to hold Junior accountable. We're going to make sure he is held accountable, and we're going to work him, and he's going to work off his debt because we're giving up a lot to keep him out of, well, they didn't have prison. So obviously the thief and his family would be hit with a big loss. The phrase, crime does not pay, but it will cost you a lot, was what God wanted to instill within their hearts and minds. Well, look at verse 2. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. If the sun has risen on him, there shall be guilt for his bloodshed. He should make full restitution. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. In other words, he now becomes a six-year bond slave. If the theft is certainly found alive in his hand, whether it is an ox or donkey or sheep, he shall restore double. We have a law in the books. What is it known as? The make my day law. You've heard of that. I know all you guys have heard of that. Everybody that owns a gun, there's a make my day. In other words, if somebody comes into your house, and God was clear, if it's at nighttime, and you ended up killing that person, you're, you're innocent. Because you don't know if that guy at nighttime, you don't know if he has a gun, a knife, he's going to kill you. Back in that day, he could have a knife, a spear, or something. And so if you killed that thief breaking into your house at night, then you're free and clear. But if it's in the daytime, then you would see, this guy doesn't have a knife, he doesn't have a weapon and you kill them, then you are going to be held accountable. So God made, makes it very clear what was permissible, what was not permissible. But if he could not repay, if they catch him red-handed, then he had to repay double, or he'd become a bond servant for a short amount of time. Again, restitution was good for everybody. 
The criminal learns to work in order to pay back, and then the victim gets reimbursed. Look at verse 5. If a man causes a field or vineyard to be grazed and lets loose his animal and it feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard. And so again, if your neighbor opens up his barn door and all the animals go into your field and eat all the crops and eat all the grapes, then you had to give that guy the best of your crops, your grapes. Verse 6, if fire breaks out and catches it in thorns so that stacked grain, standing grain, or the field is consumed, he who kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. Seems like every spring we hear about this in the Grand Valley. You know, they burn ditches, they'll burn fields, and so often it's like, why would they do that? It's 40 mile an hour winds. You don't start a fire next to your neighbor's house and then it burns it up or the garage. That's what he's referring to here. You know, we got to be careful with fire. Only you can prevent forest fires, right? Uh, James chapter 3, verse 6, it talks about the tongue being a little fire starter. You know, we start all kinds of fires with our tongues. James says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. So what comes out of our mouth, through our tongue, is what's in our hearts. This is why we got to go to the Lord. Allow Him to cleanse our hearts, renew our minds, fill us up with the Holy Spirit so we speak words of truth, words of encouragement, and so forth. Verse 7, If a man delivers to his neighbor money or articles to keep, and it is stolen out of the man's house, if the thief is found, he shall pay double. If the thief is not found, then the master of the house shall be brought to the judges to see whether he has put his hand into his neighbor's goods. So again, it's a great honor to ask, you know, be asked by a neighbor, hey, watch over my house, I'm going on a business trip. But it's also a big responsibility as well. Um, if something happened, it says, while he was away, then the judges would say, okay, you got to make this known what happened here. And if there was found that the, that guy was a thief, then he would have to restore. Verse 9, for any kind of trespass, whether it concerns an ox, a donkey, a sheep, or clothing, or for any kind of lost thing which another claims to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges. Again, they had judges. They, it wasn't just taking vengeance by yourself on your neighbor. You would always have judges, eyewitnesses. God you know, didn't want things to be done just uh, the seat of your pants. And, and whomever the judges condemn shall pay double to his neighbor. Verse 10, if a man delivers to his neighbor a donkey, an ox, a sheep, or any animal to keep, and it dies, is hurt, or driven away, no one seeing it, then an oath of the Lord shall be between them both, that he has not put his hand into his neighbor's goods, and the owner of it shall accept that, and he shall not make it good. But if, in fact, it is stolen from him, he shall make restitution to the owner of it. If it is torn to pieces by a beast, then he shall bring it as evidence, and he shall not make good what was torn. And if a man borrows anything from his neighbor and it becomes injured or dies, the owner of it not being with it, he shall surely make it good. If its owner was with it, he shall not make it good. If it was hired, it came for hire. Have you ever borrowed something from somebody and you broke it? <laughs> or you lent something to somebody and they broke it? You know, how are you going to work that out? You know, among brethren, we need to come up to, you know, with some agreeable solutions. You know, I've borrowed things from somebody, and it was literally on its last five minutes of its life. You know, they've had it for 30 years, and it broke. And I say, like, oh, great. And, and, you know, when that's happened, the other guy was like, I knew it was going to break. No big deal. You know, sometimes you're like, oh, let me buy you another whatever, shovel or something. So you just you want to do what's right. Again, these are God's basic guidelines for having a civil society. 
Uh, God had a much better plan for his people than he still does. Micah 6, 8. Still very valid, right? He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord, what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Very important that we live in such a way that people see more of Jesus and less of us. Now, I'll close with these verses. This is out of Romans 12. Uh, many of you in your Bible will have a little heading above this section called Behave Like a Christian. To me, this is how Paul summarizes these chapters that we're looking at here in Exodus. For us, God bless you. For us, Romans chapter 12, verse 9. These will be on the screen as well. These are just basic concepts that we can now walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and see the Lord work in us and through us. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. I mean, that should be obvious for all of us as Christians. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. Philadelphia, brotherly love. Not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, brotherly shove, but brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. You know, put the other person first. This, these are basic, this basic Christianity 101. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So whether you work in a secular job or wherever you do, your ultimate boss is the Lord. You're serving Him. Rejoice, uh, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. You're going through struggles, trials, difficulties in your life. Pray for patience. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Distributing to the needs of the saints. So we want to encourage the body of Christ. Given to hospitality like taking in children with little feet. Bless the... That, that was a cheap shot, sorry. <laughs> His little feet, two spots available. Given to hospitality? Are you? No, we don't want to lay guilt trips on anybody. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. This is directly out of Matthew 5, 44, the Sermon on the Mount. Bless and do not curse Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. I mean, we're the body of Christ. When one member hurts, the other members hurt. When one member rejoices, we all rejoice. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Just ask your spouse. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. That repay no one evil for evil. When our girls were little, I used to use that one on them all the time. You know, they get into a fight, an argument, and they'd push or whatever. And she hit me. She started it. And it's like, okay, end it. It can end with you. Don't repay evil with evil. Repay evil with good. That's what we're to do. And we can erase that on the tape later. If it is possible, verse 18, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. I love how he says, if it's possible, because it's not always possible. There's some real jerks out there. And you try to be nice, you try to live peaceably, but man, they just won't. You can't. So as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Ultimately, all these government officials that we like to pick on, they're held accountable by God. I can't straighten them up, and I'm not going to try. I'm not going to run for office. I wouldn't want it. But ultimately, they will stand before God, and God says, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the other one I used on my daughters as well. Again, we have a great advantage over the Israelites. How so? 
We got God's completed word from Genesis to Revelation. They didn't have this. Moses, I wouldn't even know. He's probably just starting the first chapters of Exodus at this point. We got the whole Bible. Plus, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. They didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. Holy Spirit would come upon certain Israelites at certain times for a certain task, but He was not dwelling in them. So we're without excuse. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We have the Word of God here in our hands. And so if you're going to make any New Year's resolutions, may it be, Lord, give me a hunger for your Word. Lord, help me to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit and not in the weakness of my flesh. Lord, I just want to be a light shining in this dark world. The way I like it to see it is Jesus is the light of the world. We're just little reflectors. You know, there's... We don't have light in ourselves. It's the Lord shining upon us, reflecting off of us. When the Lord says, or Paul says in God's word, do not quench the Holy Spirit within you, or do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God within you. That's like walking in the flesh. You're throwing dirt on that little reflector. So the Lord's light's still shining, but it's not reflecting very well off of you because you've thrown so much mud crud of the world on you so let the holy spirit rivers of living water wash you clean let the blood of jesus continually cleanse your heart let the word of god wash you that's what paul says in ephesians 5 25 be washed with the living water the water of the word 